When he walked up, I thought he was gonna tell me I had to start with a prayer. So I'm glad that, <laughs> thanks for volunteering. So as I said, my wife and I are serving here. We're, we're at the PCC, um, but I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my background. First, the important part is, my wife and I have five children and 20 grandchildren. We're from the Salt Lake area, but we have, with my career, we have lived in a number of locations in the, on the mainland. We've lived in the Northeast, the Southwest, and the mid, middle part of the country. And we've had some really good experience. I wanna tell you a little bit about my background because it's going to matter. And by the way, um, when he talked about your business plan and your video, I've been a judge in the last two competitions here and I have watched all of the videos for the ones that have been assigned to me. And they have been, many of them have been just exceptional and I encourage you to do a good job in these things. Be and and I, as I go, I hope that you will understand how important the things you're learning now are. You may look at it as being part of your education. I'm going to tell you right now, it's going to be part of your future. It's going to be part of your success. It's going to be part of what's going to allow you to do the things you need to do in business. Now, why do I say that? Let me just tell you a little bit about me. Okay, I am a certified public accountant and have been for 43, 44 years in the, in the, in the United States. That means that I have, over those number of years, I have consulted with businesses and I have probably consulted with uh, I'm, I know it's in the hundreds, I don't know how many it is, and there have been companies that have been Fortune 500 companies, the really big ones, international companies, and I've consulted with a number of small ones. I have been a venture capital partner. Venture capital is one of the places where people go when they have a business idea and they want money. And I've been there and seen lots of companies that have done it. I've been a senior executive, I've been a CEO, a COO, and a CFO. I've been a CFO more times than I've been the others. But in those responsibilities, I've worked with a lot of companies. I've been a business consultant. Uh, like El uh, Brother Reber, I have also been a licensed financial planner. That was something that I wanted to do. I just wanted that in my background. And interestingly enough, it's helped me, and it helped me a little bit in the next one. The last one is I've been an expert witness and a receiver in the US court system. An expert witness is somebody who gets involved in the courts, and mine was economics. But they get involved in the courts when businesses have trouble and they get involved in lawsuits. And they will go in and testify about what the problems are and how much they're worth. And then a receiver, because I was doing expert witness work in their courts, the courts then, the judges started to know who I was and they, asked me to become a receiver, and I did that a number of times. And that is when a company gets in so much trouble that the court reaches in and takes control out of the company, out of the, from the owners, and gives it to a receiver. And the receiver runs the company and shuts it down. So I've seen companies right from the start, and I've seen companies have to wind down, and I've seen all of the reasons, and I hope that as we go today, even though my discussion is gonna be on financial planning, we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the things that, that I've seen as we go. One of the last responsibilities I had, interestingly enough, was with a startup company. And these two guys came up with a great idea. They worked for months to try to find a good idea. They found a good idea, and they were able to grow it about this big. Now this is a relative factor. And, and they reached a point where they couldn't take it anymore and somebody said, you need a CFO. You need somebody to come in and help you with your finances. And we were able to take that company and it's a software as a service business. We were able to take that company into what became known in the industry as a unicorn, a company worth more than a billion dollars. And we did that relatively rapidly. It was a blast but it wasn't without a lot of work. And you're gonna hear me say this a lot, a lot of work, a lot of research, and a lot of time. Okay, one of my jobs was the CFO for a large mining organization in the, on the mainland. How many of you remember this picture from Brother Segi's presentation last week? How many of you were there? How many of you remember that picture? Do you remember why he presented that picture? 
he was with Caterpillar Machinery, and he talked about the market research. And when they would go and they would go to sell these pieces of equipment, they would research everything about their buyers. Now, research should be a word you've heard a lot in connection with your business plan. Researching what you could do for revenue, re researching your expenses, researching your competition. That's what he was talking about. And the interesting part, now this is a new truck. I was in this business 20, 23 or 24 years ago. This truck is a Caterpillar 797. It's a 400 ton truck. If that truck were parked outside this window, we would be looking right out the window, right at the cab of the truck, and we would be looking up at the top. To put it in perspective, that's the size of that truck. That truck costs $5 million. Now, the older trucks that, we, that I was overseeing, I oversaw the investment committee, and we had to review every one of these. We knew, how, we knew every aspect of one of these trucks and how long they would last and what would break first and what would break last and how long we could, we could maintain it until it died. But before we met with Caterpillar and Komatsu and the other big truck owners, we knew everything about how much it cost them to make them, how much they were selling them to our competitors, what the sellers liked about them, about what they were going to do, and then we went into our negotiations. We spent months getting ready. We had, between the organization that I worked with, with mine and a sister company, we had over 200 of these. It wasn't a small number, and we spent a lot of time. Now, you'll have the same thing, and you do the same thing. I'm sorry for pointing. I'm not pointing at any one of you. I'm just pointing in general. When you think about buying pizza, do you make a decision whether you want Domino's or Banyan, or, I don't know, Little Caesars? Do you go through in your own mind and, and, and measure those kinds of things? When you buy a Subway sandwich or you buy another hoagie sandwich, do you do that process? Do you do that when you want to buy a bike or a car or, or a scooter? Everybody does. And you need to know what that means when you're preparing your own products or your own services. Because people will look at you and they will measure you against others. And that's why I wanted to bring this point up. We would spend months before we would ever even sit down with the sellers of these vehicles because we wanted to make sure that we, we did not lose the advantage in our negotiations with them. Okay, I've overspent that point, but you're going to hear this issue about work and research. For me, you're going to hear it a lot. All right, you've been asked to put together a business plan. This is a lot of words. I'm going to take it down. I'm going to break it down into four parts. A writ written document that outlines the company's goals, strategies, and financial projections. A roadmap for how the business intends to operate. A guide for decision making and attracting potential investors. And a crucial tool for starting and managing a business. Now, I understand this is being recorded. You'll be able to see this online. But a business plan, I, as a venture capitalist, I've helped as a CPA and as a business consultant help businesses prepare their business plan. And as a venture capitalist, I saw a lot of them. And this is not just a classwork exercise. When you do this right, and you all graduate and you go out into the world, or before you graduate and you go out into the world, this business plan will be the thing that will make the big difference for you. It will help you to know how to deploy your people. Here, I'm gonna go, um, let me, I'm gonna come back to that in a second. All right, in the literature that's been given to you, these are the components of a business plan. And when, Elder Wadman and Brother Reber and Brother Segi made their presentations. They talked about nearly all of these aspects. I can't, I'm going to talk to you about financial planning. I can't talk to you about financial planning without talking about everything else. And I'm going to tell you why in just a minute. Let me, come, let me go through this though. But I'm going to talk about the funding, the financial plan mostly. But no, you, we won't escape the rest of it. And the reason we won't escape the rest of it, oh, I'm sorry. I've actually given, I gave Elder 
um, Wadman, I'm sorry, Abby Elder Wadman, a one generation old version of my presentation, so I've got to, I've got to back up for a second. So a financial plan describes what the company wants to do financially, and it's usually represented by five documents. A bu a, an income statement, a balance sheet, a statement of cash flows, a projection, and a budget. Okay, we'll come back and we'll talk about those. I understand that for many of you that are in classes, you're going to get into financial aspects next week. Is that correct? Okay, but we'll talk enough about them that you'll know why they matter. All right. It helps to determine the ways to allocate and invest your money and your people. I went into a business one time, and it was a great business. It was a business that wanted to host other people's computers. Now we think of right now, what is Amazon? Amazon has a big hosting center for all of the, you can go online, you can do it with Google, you can host all kinds of stuff out there. That didn't exist years ago. You had to hire somebody and they would help you to store your data. And this company was great. They had state of the art data and they had they'd done really well. But before they went out to market, they spent all of their money Everything they had raised, they spent all their money. And you know when I found out when they were in trouble? I found out that the first, the, the founder of the company, the first thing he did was he went out and bought an $11,000 desk. The moment he got funding, he bought an $11,000 desk. Now why does that, why is that a, give me a thought, why, why do you think that's a red light, an alarm? What do you think? Don't be afraid. He put it into places that didn't really matter in the long run. He could have sat at a banquet table and got the same work done, right? And then we saw that it was $11,000 desk and it was a new car for himself and it was really expensive salaries for his people. And by the time he built his business and got ready to do it, he had no money left. Okay, one of the things, people is one of your biggest expenses. And development of your idea is another big expense. And you've got to make sure, and this is why a financial plan is so important, because it's going to help you be able to prepare and plan this out. So it helps to allocate it and invest your money in the proper way. Okay, you can more easily monitor your performance. And, and we're gonna talk about managing cash flows and tracking financial metrics. Budgets, projections, income statements, balance sheets, statements of cash flow, it all sounds like a lot of jargon, it is. But it is critical to your business. And you'll want to understand them well enough that you can read them, and you may want to understand them well enough that you hire an accountant to help you do the work because they really matter. Okay, when you have a good financial plan, when people would come to me and they would want money, when I was, in, when I was a venture capital guy, and people would come in, if they came in, I remember a guy coming in, okay, now I see him when we go out to the beach. These guys that are on boards with the long paddles and they're standing, that's pretty cool. This guy came in with a, with a longboard, a skateboard, and a paddle. It was a big rubber ball on the end. And that's all he had. He had bought the skateboard, just a longboard, for riding on the road, and he had taken a clothing dowel and put a ball on the end of it. And then he wanted money from us. He didn't, know, he didn't know what it was gonna cost to produce him. He didn't know how, where he was gonna sell him. He didn't have any channels of distribution. He didn't have anything. He didn't know what it was gonna cost him for people, salespeople, his business managers. He didn't have any idea. Okay, that's, it, we, when, you, when you go in and you've got a good financial plan and you've thought it out, you'll get good investors or lenders. And this is a point I wanna make. A financial plan is a financial reflection of every aspect of your business plan. There is no aspect of a business plan. Now, 
Some of you may challenge me on this, but I think I could prove my point. There is no aspect of a business plan that doesn't have a financial aspect. Okay, so what is this? It's, it's my drawing on a mirror, okay? I did that. It's not very exciting, but when you look at all of the pieces of your financial plan, many of you right now are looking at it and you're saying it's a lot of work and it's a, oh, dang it. It's a lot of paper. There was just gonna be a picture of paper in that mirror, okay? Just, Trust me on that. Just be a picture of paper, and that's what you're gonna look at it. But when I look at it, and when your investors look at it, your bankers look at it, or your business partners look at it, they're gonna see that. I have actually learned that the financial plan is an equally important part of a business plan, of the market research, all of the other things you're doing, it's just equally important. So I wanna drive that home if I can, that that's, the, that's what we need to know and that's what you need to understand. All right, so five parts of a financial plan, five statements. Oh, by the way, we're gonna, we're gonna go through this fairly quickly. You can raise your hand and ask a question. So please feel free to ask questions as we go. If I say something that makes you decide that you've got, that I didn't address it well enough, go ahead and ask me. If you want to address something that on a, that's a tangent to it, that's fine. But don't, don't hesitate to raise your hand. Okay, so there's these five parts to, a, of the, to the financial statements. The first one is a balance sheet. Now a balance sheet is a statement of what a company is. I actually see the balance sheet as being the very most important aspect of a financial plan. It shows the assets that a company owns. What are assets? Somebody raise your hand and tell me what assets are. You've got some, I know there's some accounting students in here. What are assets? Yeah. Well, that's, if you get the right assets, there are things that can make profit. Assets are things. That's actually the most important part. Assets are things. They can be cash. They can be money that somebody owes you. They can be a car. They can be a truck. They can be a building. They can be a patent. There are things you own, and this young woman who said, there are things that help you raise money, and that should be true. Things on your balance sheet ought to be able to be put to use. So that was a good answer. But that's what you own. The other thing that shows up on a balance sheet is your liabilities. What are liabilities? What are liabilities? Things that you owe. Things you owe. Yes. What's a good example of a thing you owe when you're in a business? Rent, the fact you're gonna to have to pay rent is a, is a liability. If you have employees, you're gonna to have to pay salaries. If you have vendors, you're gonna to have to pay their cost of the raw materials. If you have a bank and you borrowed money, the borrowing is a liability. The other thing that shows up on a balance sheet is owner's equity, and that's what's left over. So if you take assets, less your liabilities, that's what you as an owner get left with. And I'm gonna give you an example of a balance sheet here. Okay, you're gonna note that we have assets. We say cash and inventory and accounts receivable. We've got long-term assets, which are equipment and buildings. That equals $450 in this case. Liabilities are accounts payable and short-term debt. Short-term debt may be our rent that we're gonna pay. It could be this, this month's payment of a longer, maybe something that we owe a bank. Um, ah, buttons. Um, long -term deal, the long-term debt, and then what's left down in here is this area that is called owner's equity. And that's what we have left in there. When you are successful in your business, that's the section that's going to make you happy when it grows. So it's important to understand assets minus liabilities is 
owner's equity. And you'll, you'll get to understand that. And you won't, this may not be, these numbers may not be unreal. When you start your business, are you gonna be talking in tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars? You're gonna be talking in hundreds of dollars and tens of dollars when you first start. And you're gonna measure that against that and you're gonna be really glad when you've got a little bit over for owner's equity. And you need to know what that's happening. It's worth, it's worth monitoring. We'll talk about budgeting and projections after that. Okay, an income statement is a statement, and oh, 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 oh. The thing about a balance sheet is it is a picture at a moment in time. So we prepare a balance sheet on October 31st, December 31st. Okay, we prepare it at the end of a period. An income statement is a statement that measures income and expenses over a period of time. And, and, and a, uh, an income statement is not exactly the same as cash because sometimes there'll be some things that are non-cash that are reflected there. Now, let me give you an example, and I don't want to get too detailed with that. If I buy a truck for my business or a van, and it costs me $50,000, let's say $30,000, I get to, I put that truck on my balance sheet, it's one of my assets, but I wear that truck out over time. And the wearing out of that truck over time is called depreciation. And I recognize that depreciation on my income statement. So if I were to have a truck for $36,000 and it was gonna last for three years, I would do, you know, $1,000 a month of depreciation. Does that make sense? Okay. So we see um, and, and an income statement doesn't show money you get from a bank, and it doesn't show money you get from a lender. Okay. So here's one, it's just sales. It could be revenue from services with cost of goods sold. If this was a pizza business like Elder Wadman told us about when he spoke a few weeks ago, the sales would be the sales of pizza. The cost of goods sold would be the dough and the, and the tomato sauce and the cheese and the toppings. That's what cost of goods sold is. It's what goes into what you're generating. If sales is consulting or a, a, a tourism business, that may be the fees that your customer are giving you, but cost of goods sold would be the gas that you're spending to get them to their venue it would be things that would be costs that are occurred directly in generating that income. And then expenses, salaries and wages, these are generally more, uh, these are items that are generally across the business and aren't as specifically tied to the revenue. So salaries and wages, maintenance, depreciation, taxes. Okay, the next one is kind of complicated, but it's, it sounds kind of complicated, but it really is not tough. And it's a statement of cash flows. And in accounting parlance, so this is accountant speak now, it shows us how we are generating revenue. And it does it, oh, and it does it, you see in the third line down there, operating, investing, and financing. What cash are we generating from operating the business? So that's what we get left after we've run our business and what we get. The um, investing is maybe what somebody gives us and financing is what it costs us. So here's an example. This, in this business, we have net income, which is from the bottom of our income statement. And you'll see that this section up here is from operations. So we have, we want to get to cash. So we start with net income, we add back, in this case, depreciation, uh, receivables and inventory. I'm not gonna talk too much about those. But we come down to cash that we receive from operations, costs or, in, or revenue streams that we get from investing. In this case, we invested money in a vehicle or equipment. And then we got money from financing. 
when it was all said and done, in this case, we ended up with 25 net income, net, net sources of cash or net increase in cash. And at the end of our last period, we were at $45. At the end of this period, we're at 75. So it becomes important, and it will be important for you to know where your cash is coming from. Okay, I just, I think all your eyes just kind of glazed on this one. I'm sorry. That's why you may want an accountant to help with it. Okay, please trust me here. Um, you'll want to understand it. And believe me, you will understand when you have to go to an investor to get money. You will understand when you go to a bank to get cash. You will understand when you've been to the, event, when you've been to the market and you've had a great day and you've made money. You'll know where it's coming from, and if you're being careful, you'll know where you're spending it. And that's what this shows. It's just done in more of an accounting parlance, an official form that accountants feel really good about themselves when they do it. Okay, that's about the best I can say. But it's important. Okay, now I want to talk about the statements that are the ones that are going to help you. And that is financial projections and budgets. A financial projection is your forecast of where you're going to get your cash from and where you're going to be spending it. And usually a forecast is done by month over a longer period of time. When I would see forecasts, I wanted to see them at a minimum for a full year, 12 months each month for a full year. But when I was in charge of them, I wanted them for three years. And this is a living, breathing document. You don't prepare it in month one and then say it's done, because it's not. After, and I'll show this in a, minute, a little bit more about this in a minute. After you've done it in month one, you'll go back and you'll reproject from there again. And then after month two, you'll do it again because things will not quite work out the way you project. But when you live by your projection, and that's where we do a budget, when you live by your projection and you go back and fine tune it, you then know you're in control of your business. You know what's going on. Any questions? Yeah. Would that be uh, an assign if you had an accountant, you would assign that to the accountant to do it as well? Yes. And they would come to you every month and then you would say good or bad. Okay, so I'm going to talk in a minute, but I'm going to advance forward to this. When you do a projection, and I'm going to show you here in this moment, when you do a projection, you take the next short period, the one month, maybe it's even to a week, and you prepare a budget from that. When you get done with that period, and you've made the money, or you've made, brought the income in you're going to bring in, and you've spent the money you're going to spend, you're going to compare it against your budget. When you've compared it against your budget, you're going to be over or under. Maybe you'll be right on if you've managed it well. Okay, depending on what you've learned from being over and under, you may want to come back and revisit your projection. And your accountant can help you do it, or you may get so proficient that you want to do it. But you'll actually want to do that. Let me show you. Um, budgets, budgets are not the same as income statements, nor are they statement, the same as a statement of cash flow. You will include all of your sources of income in a projection and a budget and all of your expenses. Let me show you an example. OK, a lot of detail in here. Note that these categories right here look, should look familiar. In, when I do these, I do them the same as if they're an income statement. And I do them by month, right here, and then I sum them up by year. So this first section is just a bunch of months of income statements. And they show me what I think I'm going to generate in income. Now notice the first one up there is revenue. That's not money from the bank or from an investor. It's going to be sales, 
Okay, it's my pizzas. My cost of goods sold is my cost of that. It may be, if I've got a t-shirt business, it may be the t-shirt materials and the printing materials and the embroidery costs and things like that. And then I'm gonna have the expenses I come down to net income. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add back the depreciation I, depreciation I took. Okay, now, from what I've told you already and from what you understand, why would I add back the depreciation expense? A little louder. I, I actually forgot my hearing aids, so it's a little louder for me. Good. Okay, because depreciation is a, is a convention to recognize the use of your vehicle. You don't spend that by month. You spent the money already, right? So depreciation, you add back. It's a non-cash item. Again, remember my story about the truck, $36,000? It's going to have a three-year life. I spend the $36,000 up front, and then I depreciate $100 a month. In this case, I add that back because it's not cash. And what I really want to get down to is cash. And I'm going to show you a couple of quotes later on. In business, you can quote me on this one, and it's not an original quote. Cash is king. In your business, cash is what really matters. And you'll make it or you'll break it based on your cash and your cash management. OK. So we add back depreciation. We show the debt that we raise. This is a brand new business, so I go out and I, I, I visit my banker and I, raise five, I ask him for $500. I go ahead and get that. I need to buy a trailer to be able to carry my stuff to where I want to go to sell it. Maybe it's to deliver to the vendors. Maybe it's to go to a fair, whatever. And eventually, I'm going to need to start repaying the debt. All of that shows up in here because it's all cash. Now, I want you to look here at something that's a little bit interesting. I start out with $500. Do you see down at the very bottom, this bottom line is cumulative cash flow? OK. Does, any, does anybody get nervous about anything they see on that line? It goes up and down, but when it gets low, it gets scary. And you may need to go through that in your business. You may need to know that, but it shouldn't be a surprise to you. You should do it on purpose and plan for it if it's going to happen. Does that make sense? Now I'm going to show you an example of a budget gone wrong. But that's what I want you to understand in this one. It actually looks pretty good. And you'll see that I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to be in this one. Oh, man. Used to see some people that would come in and say, this business may start at $100 in the first month, but in year two, we're going to make hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I used to say, how? It's just such a good idea. I know we're going to make it. And I'd say, how? Show me your plan. Show me a realistic projection of how you're going to get there. I just, I just know it. Okay, well, I'm not investing my money in you just knowing it. I want to see a realistic projection. Okay, and you'll see this one. We actually start and it grows fairly slowly. Maybe this is too slow. Cost of goods sold is going to be my best guess, guess on that. Wages are going to grow a little bit. Rent's going to grow maybe a little bit. But it's all something that's going to happen over time. Okay. That all makes sense for that one? Okay, now, let's get back. Yes? What should the growth rate be? That's a, so the question is, what's a reasonable growth rate? Is it 10% a month or 20% a month? And, and this is... Uh, The company that I worked for that was, that became a billion dollar valuation, it, it grew to a billion dollar valuation. It grew, uh, let's see, you gotta do this the way you guys are looking at it. It grew like this for the first seven years. Very slow, very steady. 
the founders did not want to borrow any money to do it. So they funded it themselves. And it was very slow. And I wouldn't say it was 10 or 20 percent. It was there. They did not want to risk anybody else's money in their idea. And, and, and honestly, so if you go out and borrow money, you may be able to see a faster growth rate because then they're going to be able to fund your, your, your raw materials, they're going to be able to fund your vehicles, your equipment you're going to need, whatever, right? But that's, there is not a, I'm going to, there's not a great answer to the, your question. The most important thing is that it's realistic for your business. And I would love to tell you, now I would, I would tell you that as a venture capitalist, I hoped that we would see our money grow by 20% a year, not by month, by year. Now when that's compounded, do you all understand the concept of 20% after one year, and then that grows by another 20% in the next year, and another 20%, there's, it actually goes like this really fast. It's called compounding. But um, this grew really slow like this, and then when we finally got to the point where we, and when I joined and we got some things done, it went like that. And it was, and, it, and, and the answer is, if you want to borrow money and you want to make success, just understand what you're risking when you're borrowing money or investing or getting investors, and then understand what, what it means to, you know, how, how it's going to affect you. And, um, Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on because I'll come back to that a little bit more. That was a really good question, by the way. And I'm sorry, I probably haven't done it justice, but um, any other questions before I move on? Yeah? What is a good, ideal net profit margin? So are you talking about this area down here? Uh, actually, and in, in an income statement, net income there? Or are you talking about after cost of goods sold? Okay, there's a gross profit and a net profit. Okay, gross profit is after cost of goods sold. Net profit is quite often described as net income. I think you're talking about this one. I can tell you here that a, a respectable gross profit percentage is 50%. So if you have a, an item up here, I don't quite have it built in here that way. But if I had $500 there and $250 there, my gross profit would be $250. That would be a respectable gross profit percentage. And then quite often down here at net income, it really, it really varies, 10, 12, 14, 16% type of a thing. But it's gonna be really low off the bat until the company gets its, uh, there's a, a, an author named, uh, uh, Jim Collins that talks about a flywheel. Starting a business, do you know what a flywheel is? A flywheel is a really big, heavy metal wheel. And if you stand to push it, you can barely get it going. But the more you push it, the more it gets going. And then when you stop pushing it, because it's got this flywheel or this heavy effect, it just keeps going. And that's what happens in business. It's hard to get it going, but then once you do it, then you'll see those percentages will go up. I've had businesses that I've overseen where I always look to see 50% here, and I've actually had businesses down here that were about 22% that I've worked with. But they were ones that were established. Does that help? But I wouldn't build that automatically into your model because your model needs to be real. Okay, budgets. A budget's usually tied to your projection, and it is the, it is the short-term document you live by. So um, do you remember these percentages, these numbers down here in the bottom? I want you to look at this percentage, I want you to look at this budget and tell me if you see any problems. Now, I, oh, I said this earlier. A budget is reconciled to actual after the end of every period. And then you may go back and you may, so you'll say, I want to make this amount, I want to bring in this amount of cash, and I want to spend this amount of money. And when I was done, I actually brought in this amount of cash, and I spent this amount of money, and they were different. And you may go back and redo your projection. You definitely will redo your next month's budget. 
Okay, this one we projected that we were gonna end up with net income or net cash flow of $340. Um, I mean, we, we said we were gonna do it, we actually ended up with 307, we were 33 short. Okay, if I have a month in my projections where I've only got $40 cash, does the fact that you're $33 short scare you? Boy, it'd bother the heck out of me. This is why living your budget, if you, see, if you get into a business and you see somebody up here that is buying an $11,000 desk, tell them you're not joining their business. You need to manage what's going on really, really tightly. Does that make sense? And so you'll actually go through this process and it's iterative. You do a projection, that may be for a year. You look at the month, and from the next month you make a budget. And then you work really hard to live by that budget and if there's a variance, you make sure there's a really good reason why there's a variance. At the end of that period, you reconcile what you said you were going to spend about against you, what we were going to spend. And if you did well, you may go back and adjust your projections for a reason. If you did poorly, you need to go back and really project, adjust your projections. Okay. I said this before. Cash is king, and Jack Welch, Jack Welch was the CEO of General Electric a number of years ago, and he said, if I had to run a company on three measures, those measures would be customer satisfaction, employee satisfaction, and cash flow. And then Sir Richard Branson said, never take your eyes off cash flow because it's the lifeblood of your business. And if I haven't done anything else tonight, I want you to understand that it is the lifeblood of your business. It's what really makes a difference. And it's the bottom line to, to whether you're gonna be successful or not. If you, if you run out of cash, it's a rough spot to be. And if, you're, if you project you're starting to run out of cash, but you've got uh, some motion in your flywheel, things look like they're moving, that may be the moment that it's time to go visit a bank or an investor so that you can get, you can get more out of them. Okay, all right, recipe for, for uh, creating a realistic financial plan. And I actually rewrote this in the next version. You know what a recipe is? Make bread, make a cake, make cookies, okay. You start with six parts research. And this will be the biggest issue you'll have to address and there is no end to the research you can do. And you've learned it, you've learned it in, this, in the last three weeks from each of the speakers about different aspects of, of research. We talked last week about market research. Remember I, uh, Brother Segi made the comment about knowing everything about the buyer of those big trucks. Whether they like golf or they didn't like golf, whether they like what they like to eat, okay? When you're trying to figure out your product, somebody here asked me one night, how do I know what it's going to cost me to manufacture something? Well, there are people that actually, there are places you can go where you can actually say, I want to manufacture something, and um, how much would it cost to do it? And there'll be people in different areas of the world that will propose to manufacture it for you and tell you what the cost will be. Um, if you want to make something that is easy locally, now let's say you want to do pizzas. You know what pizzas sell for around here, right? And unless you're going to make a gourmet pizza or something that is going to be um, just super nice and going to have the ultimate taste in pizzas, you know what somebody can go down the street and buy a pizza for at Domino's. That's easy to find out. You can walk in their front door and find that out, right? You can walk into, a, you can walk into a, a food supply place and you can find out what it costs to buy flour and what it costs to buy um, tomato sauce and cheese and those kinds of things. But you'll never learn those numbers without going and doing the research. You just won't. Um, I talked the other night with a, 
woman who, who she said she and her husband competed in this competition and they wanted to do travel vans. And apparently they did pretty well in the competition. And they've been running a business with travel vans where they rent a van out to people that want to travel around Oahu and they've had a great business. And it's worked really well for them. But they found that they hadn't, and they've done it for several years now, but they hadn't found out how hard it was going to be to maintain the vans. And they wanted to move in another direction. So they're going to just sell the business. And I think that they're going to do really well with it. And they've done well with the business. It's just no, something they didn't know. OK, uh, three parts asking questions to knowledgeable people. That's another in, a key ingredient. Um, trial and error. Um, when you do, there, some big companies have research departments. And they're charged with, if there's a product, um, I had a company I was on the board with a number of years ago, and I loved the idea. These young men served their mission in areas of the world where soccer, football, was a really exciting, it was the big sport, but the ball that they play with, the one that, they, that we usually use on grass, doesn't work well on the fields that they had, which was pavement or dirt. When you kick them, they travel too fast. And so they spent a fair amount of money on how to build a soccer ball that would be, have the same feel and touch as a regular soccer ball, but you could, we could play it on this carpeted floor. And that was a really good business. They made two mistakes. One is they thought they could make a lot of money off of t-shirts with that business. T-shirts is a really hard business. And you've got to keep changing your design of your t-shirts really often. And they didn't do that. And so they ended up with a large inventory of shirts that didn't sell. And the other one they didn't figure out was, how do they distribute these soccer balls in these third world locations? How could they sell them? It was just a, it, it was an interesting challenge. And they finally did some nice things, but it was an interesting challenge. OK, so trial and error is necessary. And, and, and uh, when you go to visit your your sources of funds, very often they'll want to see something that you have developed. If it's a product, they'll want a prototype. Do you know what a prototype is? A prototype is, if I wanted to develop a clicker, I would it would be the first generation of what this is. It wouldn't be nearly this beautiful. It would probably be made with a clunky looking set of exterior, but it would make my computer click. That would be the early version. And then I would mix those ingredients together, and then I would repeat them again until I find success. And there's not a good answer. You're, what you're learning here in this competition will be what will help you to be successful. And if you don't, if you don't want to do the work, you don't want to develop a financial plan, you don't want to do your market research, you don't want to do your product differentiation work, you don't want to look at your value proposition. If you don't want to do any of that, you might be the one in a thousand who are lucky. But chances are you're going to be the 999 who fail. It's just the answer. And the nice part about this, I've never seen, I think I've, I've been in, I think BYU does something like this, but I went to the University of Utah um, and, and it, there wasn't anything like this when I went to school. And then when I've been in the real world practicing, I've just not seen very much like this. OK, so let's talk real quickly the benefits of having a financial plan. I'm just going to bring these up. Financial plan reflects the rest of the business. It helps us to stay on track. That's the reason we do a financial plan. It keeps everybody in the financial plan on the same page. We used to meet with all of our employees. And at one point in time, we started, when I started with the one company, the last one I was with before I retired, we had 100 employees. We ended up being well over 1,000. But we would meet every month, and we would tell our employees what our goals were for that month and what we wanted to accomplish. And everybody had in their mind what we were trying to do. What was the new product? How we were trying to sell it? 
what were the changes to the old product, how we could introduce that to our clients. And, and then we would uh, share our financial goals. So everybody kind of knew what was going on. And then when you have a good financial plan, it leads to real projections, real-time projections that are meaningful. And as I mentioned earlier, do you remember the mirror with a dollar sign in the middle? When you look at, uh, I've got to go out and do a market differentiation study. I need to see why my product's going to make it in the market and it's going to be different than the others. And I'm willing to spend, or I need to spend, X number of dollars. That X number of dollars is a direct reflection of what that item is. And it needs to be in your projection. And it needs to then show up in your budget. Okay. Um, now, there are, uh, when I was in this venture capital business, we hit the housing crisis in 2008. That was the Great Recession that affected the entire world. It affected North America and, and the mainland pretty heavily. It affected Hawaii really heavily. When that happened, some of our, our investments, the companies we were invested in, had done a really good job of preparing. But many of them found themselves and they just <laughs> hit, the, hit the wall. They had no money set aside. They had no plan. And the nice thing about a financial projection is that it will help you to deal with volatility. Volatility is the ups and downs that happen in the market all the time. They're what happened in the, in the environment around us. And then, um, and, and, and really important here is, when you go to see somebody to raise money, if you go to a bank or you go to an investor and they're there are lots of different kinds of investors, but if you go to an investor and they know what they're talking about, you may go to your dad or your uncle, and they may say, I like you, I'm willing to back you. And in their mind, they're like, and I'm willing to lose that money. <laughs> Truth. But if you go to somebody that, that, that uh, you haven't met before, they're going to look at you and say, do I like you? And have you prepared yourself to take my money and to put it to work? And are you going to be able to pay me back? And your business plan is going to the mean, with a financial plan, is going to be the means by which they will be able to make that decision. Okay, that's the end of my presentation. We've taken most of the time. I think we're supposed to break up into workshops, but what other questions do you have? Do we have a moment or two for more questions? Well, you may have just answered the point. If we don't have any questions, then I don't have to worry about it. Thanks. Yeah. Round of applause.